It was on the afternoon of the same day that Gant at last unburdened himself to Rieux. Noticing Madame Rieux's photograph on the desk, he looked at the doctor inquiringly. Rieux told him that his wife was under treatment in a sanatorium some distance from the town. In one way, Gant said, that's lucky. The doctor agreed that it was lucky in a sense, but he added, the great thing was that his wife should recover. Yes, Gant said, I understand. And then, for the first time since Rieu had made his acquaintance, he became quite voluble. Though he still had trouble over his words, he succeeded nearly always in finding them. Indeed, it was as if for years he'd been thinking over what he now said. When in his teens, he had married a very young girl, one of a poor family living nearby. It was, in fact, in order to marry that he'd abandoned his studies and taken up his present job. Neither he nor Jeanne ever stirred from their part of the town. In his courting days, he used to go to see her at her home, and the family were inclined to make fun of her bashful, silent admirer. Her father was a railroad man. When off duty, he spent most of the time seated in a corner beside the window, gazing meditatively at the passers-by, his enormous hands splayed out on his thighs. His wife was always busy with domestic duties, in which Jeanne gave her a hand. Jeanne was so tiny that it always made Gant nervous to see her crossing a street. The vehicles bearing down on her looked so gigantic. Then one day, shortly before Christmas, they went out for a short walk together and stopped to admire a gaily decorated shop window. After gazing ecstatically at it for some moments, Jeanne turned to him. Oh, isn't it lovely? He squeezed her wrist. It was thus that the marriage had come about. The rest of the story, to Grand's thinking, was very simple. The common lot of married couples. You get married, you go on living a bit longer, you work. And you work so hard that it makes you forget to love. As the head of the office where Gant was employed hadn't kept his promise, Jeanne too had to work outside. At this point, a little imagination was needed to grasp what Gant was trying to convey. Owing largely to fatigue, he gradually lost grip of himself, had less and less to say, and failed to keep alive the feeling in his wife that she was loved. An overworked husband, poverty, the gradual loss of hope in a better future, silent evenings at home, what chance had any passion of surviving such conditions? Probably Jeanne had suffered, and yet she'd stayed. Of course, one may often suffer a long time without knowing it. Thus years went by. Then one day she left him. Naturally, she hadn't gone alone. I was very fond of you, but now I'm so tired. I'm not happy to go, but one needn't be happy to make another start. That, more or less, was what she'd said in her letter. Grand, too, had suffered. And he too might, as Rieu pointed out, have made a fresh start. But no, he had lost faith. Only he couldn't stop thinking about her. What he'd have liked to do was to write her a letter justifying himself. But it's not easy, he told Rieu. I've been thinking it over for years. While we loved each other, we didn't need words to make ourselves understood. But people don't love forever. A time came when I should have found the words to keep her with me, only I couldn't. Grand produced from his pocket something that looked like a check duster and blew his nose noisily. Then he wiped his moustache. Rieu gazed at him in silence. Forgive me, doctor, Grand added hastily, but how shall I put it? I feel you're to be trusted. That's why I can talk to you about these things. And then, you see, I get all worked up. Obviously, Grand's thoughts were leagues away from the plague. That evening, Rieu sent a telegram to his wife telling her that the town was closed, that she must go on taking great care of herself, and that she was in his thoughts. One evening, when he was leaving the hospital, it was about three weeks after the closing of the gates, Rieu found a young man waiting for him in the street. You remember me, don't you? Rieu believed he did, but couldn't quite place him. I called on you just before this trouble started, the young man said, for information about the living conditions in the Arab quarter. My name is Raymond Rambert. Ah, yes, of course. Well, you've now the makings of a good story for your paper. Rambert, who gave the impression of being much less self-assured than he had seemed on the first occasion when they met, said it wasn't that he'd come about. He wanted to know if the doctor would kindly give him some help. I must apologize, he continued, but really, I don't know a soul here, and the local representative of my paper is a complete dud. Rieu said he had to go to a dispensary in the center of town and suggested they should walk there together. Their way lay through the narrow streets of the Negro district. Evening was coming on, but the town, once so noisy at this hour, was strangely still. The only sounds were some bugle calls echoing through the air, still golden with the end of daylight. The army, anyhow, was making a show of carrying on as usual. 
Meanwhile, as they walked down the steep little streets flanked by blue mauve and saffron yellow walls, Rambert talked incessantly, as if his nerves were out of hand. He had left his wife in Paris, he said. Well, she wasn't actually his wife, but it came to the same thing. The moment the town was put into quarantine, he had sent her a wire. His impression then was that this state of things was quite temporary, and all he tried to do was to get a letter through to her. But the post office officials had vetoed this, his colleagues of the local press said they could do nothing for him, and a clerk in the prefect's office had laughed in his face. It was only after waiting in line for a couple of hours that he had managed to get a telegram accepted. All goes well. Hope to see you soon. But next morning, when he woke up, it had dawned on him that after all there was absolutely no knowing how long this business was going to last. So he decided to leave the town at once. Being able, thanks to his professional status, to pull some strings, he had secured an interview with a high official in the prefect's office. He had explained that his presence in Oran was purely accidental, that he had no connection with the town and no reasons for staying in it. That being so, he surely was entitled to leave, even if once outside the town he had to undergo a spell of quarantine. The official told him he quite appreciated his position, but no exceptions could be made. He would, however, see if anything could be done, though he could hold out little hope of a quick decision as the authorities were taking a very serious view of the situation. But confounded, Rambert exclaimed, I don't belong here. Quite so. Anyhow, let's hope the epidemic will soon be over. Finally, he had tried to console Rambert by pointing out that, as a journalist, he had an excellent subject to his hand in Oran. Indeed, when one came to think of it, no event, however disagreeable in some ways, but had its bright side. Whereat Rambert had shrugged his shoulders petulantly and walked out. Rieux and Rambert had come to the center of the town. It's so damn silly, Doctor, isn't it? The truth is, I wasn't brought into the world to write newspaper articles. But it's quite likely I was brought into the world to live with a woman. That's reasonable enough, isn't it? Rieux replied cautiously that there might be something in what he said. The central boulevards were not so crowded as usual. The few people about were hurrying to distant homes. Not a smile was to be seen on any face. Rieux guessed that this was a result of the latest Hansdach announcement. After 24 hours, our townspeople would begin to hope again. But on the days when they were announced, the statistics were too fresh in everybody's memory. The truth, Rambert remarked abruptly, is that she and I have been together only a short time, and we suit each other perfectly. When Rieux said nothing, he continued, I can see I'm boring you. Sorry. All I wanted to know was whether you couldn't possibly give me a certificate stating that I haven't got this damn disease. It might make things easier, I think. Rieu nodded. A small boy had just run against his legs and fallen. He set him on his feet again. Walking on, they came to the Place d'Arme. Gray with dust, the palms and fig trees drooped despondently around a statue of the Republic, which, too, was coated with grime and dust. They stopped beside the statue. Rieu stamped his feet on the flagstones to shake off the coat of white dust that had gathered on them. His hat pushed slightly back, his shirt collar gaping under a loosely knotted tie, his cheeks ill-shaven. The journalist had a sulky, stubborn look of a young man who feels himself deeply injured. Please don't doubt I understand you, Rieu said, but you must see your argument doesn't hold water. I can't give you that certificate because I don't know whether you have the disease or not. And even if I did, how could I certify that between the moment of leaving my consulting room and your arrival at the prefect's office, you wouldn't be infected? And even if I did, and even if you did, even if I gave you a certificate, it wouldn't help. Why not? Because there are thousands of people placed as you are in this town, and there can't be any question of allowing them to leave it. Even supposing they haven't got the plague? That's not a sufficient reason. Oh, I know it's an absurd situation, but we're all involved in it and we've got to accept it as it is. But I don't belong here. Unfortunately, from now on, you'll belong here like everybody else. Rambert raised his voice a little. But damn it, doctor, can't you see it's a matter of common human feeling? Or don't you realize what this sort of separation means to people who are fond of each other? Rieu was silent for a moment. Then he said he understood it perfectly. He wished nothing better than that Rambert should be allowed to return to his wife and that all who loved one another and were parted should come together again. Only, the law was the law. Plague had broken out, and he could only do what had to be done. No, Rambert said bitterly, you can't understand. You're using the language of reason, not of the heart. You live in a world of abstractions. The doctor glanced up at the Statue of the Republic and then said he didn't know if he was using the language of reason 
but he knew he was using the language of the facts as everybody could see them, which wasn't necessarily the same thing. The journalist tugged at his tie to straighten it. So, I take it I can't count on help from you. Very good. But, his tone was challenging, leave this town, I shall. The doctor repeated that he quite understood, but all that was none of his business. Excuse me, but it is your business. Aubert raised his voice again. I approached you because I'd been told you played a large part in drawing up the orders that have been issued. So I thought that in one case, anyhow, you could unmake what you helped to make. But you don't care. You never gave a thought to anybody. You didn't take the case of people who were separated into account. Rieu admitted this was true up to a point. He'd preferred not to take such cases into account. Ah, I see now, Hombier exclaimed. You'll soon be talking about the interests of the general public. But public welfare is merely the sum total of the private welfares of each of us. The doctor seemed abruptly to come out of a dream. Oh, come, he said. There's that, but there's much more to it than that. It doesn't do to rush to conclusions, you know. But you've no reason to feel angered. I assure you that if you find a way out of your quandary, I shall be extremely pleased. Only there are things that my official position debars me from doing. Hombert tossed his head petulantly. Yes, yes, I was wrong to show annoyance. And I've taken up too much of your time already. Rieu asked him to let him know how he got on with his project and not to bear him a grudge for not having been more amenable. He was sure, he added, that there was some common ground on which they could meet. Hombert looked perplexed. Then, yes, he said after a short silence, I rather think so too, in spite of myself, and of all you've just been saying. He paused. Still, I can't agree with you. Pulling down his hat over his eyes, he walked quickly away. Rieu saw him enter the hotel where Tarou was staying. After a moment, the doctor gave a slight nod, as if approving of some thought that had crossed his mind. Yes, the journalist was right in refusing to be balked of happiness. But was he right in reproaching him, Rieu, with living in a world of abstractions? Could that term, abstraction, really apply to these days he spent in his hospital while the plague was battening on the town, raising its death toll to 500 victims a week? Yes, an element of abstraction, of a divorce from reality, entered into such calamities. Still, when abstraction sets to killing you, you've got to get busy with it. And so much Rieu knew that this wasn't the easiest course. Running his auxiliary hospital, for instance, of which he was in charge, there were now three such hospitals, was no light task. He'd had an anteroom leading into his surgery installed, equipped for dealing with patients on arrival. The floor had been excavated and replaced by a shallow lake of water and chrysilic acid, in the center of which was a sort of island made of bricks. The patient was carried to the island, rapidly undressed, and his clothes dropped into the disinfectant water. After being washed, dried, and dressed in one of the coarse hospital nightshirts, he was taken to Rieu for examination, then carried to one of the wards. This hospital, a requisition schoolhouse, now contained 500 beds, almost all of which were occupied. After the reception of the patients, which he personally supervised, Rieu injected serum, Lance Bubos, checked the statistics again, and returned for his afternoon consultations. Only when night was setting in did he start on his round of visits, and he never got home till a very late hour. On the previous night, his mother, when handing him a telegram from his wife, had remarked that his hands were shaking. Yes, he said, but it's only a matter of sticking to it, and my nerves will steady down. You'll see. He had a robust constitution, and as yet wasn't really tired. Still, his visits, for one thing, were beginning to put a great strain on his endurance. Once the epidemic was diagnosed, the patient had to be evacuated forthwith. Then, indeed, began abstraction, and a tussle with the family who knew they would not see the sick man again until he was dead or cured. Have some pity, doctor. It was Madame Loret mother of the chambermaid at Tarou's hotel who made the appeal. An unnecessary appeal. Of course he had pity. But what purpose could it serve? He had to telephone, and soon the ambulance could be heard clanging down the street. At first, the neighbors used to open windows and watch. Later, they promptly shut them. Then came a second phase of conflict. Tears and pleadings. Abstraction, in a word. In those fever-hot, nerve-ridden sick rooms, crazy scenes took place. But the issue was always the same. The patient was removed. Then Rieu, too, could leave. In the early days, he had merely telephoned, then rushed off to see other patients without waiting for the ambulance. But no sooner was he gone than the family locked and barred their doors, preferring contact with the plague to a parting whose issue they now knew only too well. There followed objurgations, 
screams, batterings on the door, action by the police, and later armed force. The patient was taken by storm. Thus, during the first few weeks, Rieu was compelled to stay with the patient till the ambulance came. Later, when each doctor was accompanied by a volunteer police officer, Rieu could hurry away to the next patient. But to begin with, every evening was like that evening when he was called in for Madame Loret's daughter. He was shown into a small apartment decorated with fans and artificial flowers. The mother greeted him with a faltering smile. Oh, I do hope it's not the fever everyone's talking about. Lifting the coverlet and chemise, he gazed in silence at the red blotches on the girl's thighs and stomach, the swollen ganglia. After one glance, the mother broke into shrill, uncontrollable cries of grief. And every evening, mothers wailed thus, with a distraught abstraction, as their eyes fell on those fatal stigmata on limbs and bellies. Every evening, hands gripped the ears' arms. There was a rush of useless words, promises, and tears. Every evening, the nearing toxin of the ambulance provoked scenes as vain as every form of grief. Rieu had nothing to look forward to but a long sequence of such scenes, renewed again and again. Yes, plague, like abstraction, was monotonous. Perhaps only one factor changed, and that was Rieu himself. Standing at the foot of the Statue of the Republic that evening, he felt it. All he was conscious of was a bleak indifference steadily gaining on him as he gazed at the door of the Hotel Rambert had just entered. After these wearing weeks, after all those nightfalls when the townsfolk poured into the streets to roam them aimlessly, Rieu had learned that he need no longer steel himself against pity. One grows out of pity when it's useless. And in this feeling that his heart had slowly closed on itself, the doctor found a solace, his only solace, for the almost unendurable burden of his days. This, he knew, would make his task easier, and therefore he was glad of it. When he came home at two in the morning and his mother was shocked at the blank look he gave her, she was deploring precisely the sole alleviation Rieu could then experience. To fight abstraction, you must have something of it in your own makeup. But how could Rambert be expected to grasp that? Abstraction, for him, was all that stood in the way of his happiness. Indeed, Rieu had to admit the journalist was right, in one sense. But he knew, too, that abstraction sometimes proves itself stronger than happiness. And then, if only then, it has to be taken into account. And this was what was going to happen to Rambert, as the doctor was to learn when, much later, Rambert told him more about himself. Thus he was unable to follow, and on a different plane, the dreary struggle in progress between each man's happiness and the abstractions of the plague, which constituted the whole life of our town over a long period of time. But where some saw abstraction, others saw the truth. The first month of the plague ended gloomily, with a violent recrudescence of the epidemic, and a dramatic sermon preached by Father Panlou, the Jesuit priest who had given an arm to old Michel when he was tottering home at the start of his illness. Father Panlou had already made his mark with frequent contributions to the Oran Geographical Society. These dealt chiefly with ancient inscriptions, on which he was an authority but he had also reached a wider, non-specialist public with a series of lectures on present-day individualism. In these, he had shown himself a stalwart champion of Christian doctrine at its most precise and purest, equally remote from modern laxity and the obscurantism of the past. On these occasions, he had not shrunk from trouncing his hearers with some vigorous home truths, hence his local celebrity. Toward the end of the month, the ecclesiastical authorities in our town resolved to do battle against the plague with the weapons appropriate to them, and organized a week of prayer. These manifestations of public piety would be concluded on Sunday by a high mass celebrated under the auspices of St. Roque, the plague-stricken saint, and Father Panlou was asked to preach the sermon. For a fortnight, he desisted from the research work on St. Augustine and the African church that had won for him a high place in his order. A man of passionate, fiery temperament, he flung himself wholeheartedly into the task assigned him. The sermon was a topic of conversation long before it was delivered, and in its way marks an important date in the history of the period. There were large attendances at the services of the week of prayer. It must not, however, be assumed that in normal times the townsfolk of Oran are particularly devout. On Sunday mornings, for instance, sea bathing competes seriously with church going. Nor must it be thought that they had seen a great light and had a sudden change of heart. But for one thing, now that the town was closed and the harbour out of bounds, there was no question of bathing. Moreover, they were in a quite exceptional frame of mind, and though in their hearts they were far from recognising the enormity of what had come on them, 
they couldn't help feeling for obvious reasons that decidedly something had changed. Nevertheless, many continued hoping that the epidemic would soon die out and they and their families be spared. Thus, they felt under no obligation to make any change in their habits as yet. Plague was for them an unwelcome visitant, bound to take its leave one day as unexpectedly as it had come. Alarmed, but far from desperate, they hadn't yet reached the phase when plague would seem to them the very tissue of their existence, when they forgot the lives that until now it had been given them to lead. In short, they were waiting for the turn of events. With regard to religion, as to many other problems, plague had induced in them a curious frame of mind, as remote from indifference as from fervor. The best name to give it, perhaps, might be objectivity. Most of those who took part in the week of prayer would have echoed a remark made by one of the churchgoers in Dr. Rieu's hearing. Anyhow, it can't do any harm. Even Tahu, after recording in his notebook that in such cases the Chinese fall to playing tambourines before the genius of plague, observed that there was no means of telling whether, in practice, tambourines proved more efficacious than prophylactic measures. He merely added that, to decide the point, we should need first to ascertain if a genius of plague actually existed, and our ignorance on this point nullified any opinions we might form. In any case, the cathedral was practically always full of worshippers throughout the week of prayer. For the first two or three days, many stayed outside, under the palms and pomegranate trees in the garden in front of the porch, and listened from a distance to the swelling tide of prayers and invocations whose backwash filled the neighboring streets. But once an example had been given, they began to enter the cathedral and join timidly in the responses. And on the Sunday of the sermon, a huge congregation filled the nave, overflowing onto the steps and precincts. The sky had clouded up on the previous day, and now it was raining heavily. Those in the open unfurled umbrellas. The air inside the cathedral was heavy with fumes of incense and the smell of wet clothes when Father Panlou stepped into the pulpit. He was a stockily built man of medium height. When he leaned on the edge of the pulpit, grasping the woodwork with his big hands, all one saw was a black, massive torso and above it two rosy cheeks overhung by steel-rimmed spectacles. He had a powerful, rather emotional delivery which carried to a great distance and when he launched at the congregation his opening phrase in clear, emphatic tones, Calamity has come on you, my brethren, and, my brethren, you deserved it, there was a flutter that extended to the crowd massed in the rain outside the porch. In strict logic, what came next did not seem to follow from this dramatic opening. Only as the sermon proceeded did it become apparent to the congregation that, by a skillful oratorical device, Father Panlou had launched at them like a fisticuff the gist of his whole discourse. After launching on it, he went on at once to quote a text from Exodus relating to the plague of Egypt and said, The first time this scourge appears in history, it was wielded to strike down the enemies of God. Pharaoh set himself up against the divine will, and the plague beat him to his knees. Thus, from the dawn of recorded history, the scourge of God has humbled the proud of heart and laid low those who hardened themselves against him. Ponder this well, my friends, and fall on your knees. The downpour had increased in violence, and these words, striking through a silence intensified by the drumming of raindrops on the chancel windows, carried such conviction that after a momentary hesitation, some of the worshippers slipped forward from their seats onto their knees. Others felt it right to follow their example, and the movement gradually spread until presently everyone was kneeling, from end to end of the cathedral. No sound, except an occasional creak of chairs, accompanied the movement. Then Pan Lu drew himself up to his full height, took a deep breath, and continued his sermon in a voice that gathered strength as it proceeded. If today the plague is in your midst, that is because the hour has struck for taking thought. The just man need have no fear, but the evildoer has good cause to tremble. For plague is the flail of God, and the world his threshing floor and implacably he will thresh out his harvest until the wheat is separated from the chaff. There will be more chaff than wheat, a few chosen of the many called. Yet this calamity was not willed by God. Too long this world of ours has connived at evil. Too long has it counted on the divine mercy, on God's forgiveness. Repentance was enough, men thought. Nothing was forbidden. Everyone felt comfortably assured. When the day came, he would surely turn from his sins and repent, Pending that day, the easiest course was to surrender all along the line. Divine compassion would do the rest. 
For a long while, God gazed down on this town with eyes of compassion. But he grew weary of waiting. His eternal hope was too long deferred. And now he has turned his face away from us. And so, God's light withdrawn, we walk in darkness, in the thick darkness of this plague. Someone in the congregation gave a little snort, like that of a restive horse. After a short silence, the preacher continued in a lower tone. We read in the golden legend that in the time of King Umberto, Italy was swept by plague, and its greatest ravages took place in Rome and Pavia. So dreadful were these that the living hardly sufficed to bury the dead. And a good angel was made visible to human eyes, giving his orders to an evil angel who bore a great hunting spear and bidding him strike the houses. And as many strokes as he dealt a house, so many dead were carried out of it. Here Panlu stretched forth his two short arms toward the open porch, as if pointing to something behind the tumbling curtain of the rain. My brothers, he cried, that fatal hunt is up and harrying our streets today. See him there, that angel of the pestilence, comely as Lucifer, shining like evil's very self. He is hovering above your roofs with his great spear in his right hand poised to strike, while his left hand is stretched toward one or other of your houses. Maybe at this very moment his finger is pointing to your door, the red spear crashing on its panels. And even now the plague is entering your home and settling down in your bedroom to await your return. Patient and watchful, ineluctable is the order of the scheme of things, it bides its time. No earthly power, nay, not even, mark me well, the vaunted might of human science can avail you to avert that hand once it is stretched toward you. And winnowed like corn on the blood-stained threshing floor of suffering, you will be cast away with the chaff. At this point, the father reverted with heightened eloquence to the symbol of the flail. He bade his hearers picture a huge wooden bar whirling above the town, striking at random, swinging up again in a shower of drops of blood, and spreading carnage and suffering on earth for the seed time that shall prepare the harvest of the truth. At the end of his long phrase, Father Pandalou paused. His hair was straggling over his forehead, his body shaken by tremors that his hands communicated to the pulpit. When he spoke again, his voice was lower, but vibrant with accusation. Yes, the hour has come for serious thought. You fondly imagined it was enough to visit God on Sundays, and thus you could make free of your weekdays. You believed some brief formalities, some bendings of the knee, would recompense him well enough for your criminal indifference. But God is not mocked. These brief encounters could not sate the fierce hunger of his love. He wished to see you longer and more often. That is his manner of loving. And indeed, it is the only manner of loving. And this is why, wearied of waiting for you to come to him, he loosed on you this visitation as he has visited all the cities that offended against him since the dawn of history. Now you are learning your lesson, the lesson that was learned by Cain and his offspring, by the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, by Job and Pharaoh, by all that hardened their hearts against him. And like them, you have been beholding mankind and all creation with new eyes since the gates of this city closed on you and on the pestilence. Now at last, you know the hour has struck to bend your thoughts to first and last things. A wet wind was sweeping up the nave, making the candle flames bend and flicker. The pungency of burning wax, coughs, a stifled sneeze rose toward Father Panlu, who, reverting to his exordium with a subtlety that was much appreciated, went on in a calm, almost matter-of-fact voice. Many of you are wondering, I know, what I am leading up to. I wish to lead you to the truth, and teach you to rejoice, yes, rejoice, in spite of all that I've been telling you. For the time is past when a helping hand or mere words of good advice could set you on the right path. Today the truth is a command. It is a red spear sternly pointing to the narrow path, the one way of salvation. And thus, my brothers, at last it is revealed to you the divine compassion which has ordained good and evil in everything, wrath and pity, the plague and your salvation. This same pestilence which is slaying you works for your good and points your path. Many centuries ago, the Christians of Abyssinia saw in the plague a sure and God-sent means of winning eternal life. Those who were not yet stricken wrapped round them sheets in which men had died of plague so as to make sure of their death. 
I grant you such a frenzied quest of salvation is not to be commended. It shows an overhaste, indeed a presumptuousness, which we can but deplore. No man should seek to force God's hand or to hurry on the appointed hour. And from a practice that aims at speeding up the order of events which God has ordained unalterably from all time, it is but a step to heresy. Yet we can learn a salutary lesson from the zeal, excessive though it was, of those Abyssinian Christians. Much of it is alien to our more enlightened spirits, and yet it gives us a small glimpse of that radiant eternal light which glows, a small still flame, in the dark core of human suffering. And this light too illuminates the shadowed paths that lead toward deliverance. It reveals the will of God in action, unfailingly transforming evil into good. And once again today, it is leading us through the dark valley of fears and groans toward the holy silence, the wellspring of all life. This, my friends, is the vast consolation I would hold out to you, so that when you leave this house of God, you will carry away with you not only words of wrath, but a message, too, of comfort for your hearts. Everyone supposed that the sermon had ended. Outside, the rain had ceased, and watery sunshine was yellowing the cathedral square. Vague sounds of voices came from the streets and a low hum of traffic, the speech of an awakening town. Discreetly, with a subdued rustling, the congregation gathered together their belongings. However, the father had a few more words to say. He told them that after having made it clear that this plague came from God for the punishment of their sins, he would not have recourse, in concluding, to an eloquence that, considering the tragic nature of the occasion, would be out of keeping. He hoped and believed that all of them now saw their position in its true light. But, before leaving the pulpit, he would like to tell them of something he had been reading in an old chronicle of the Black Death at Marseille. In it, Mathieu Marais, the chronicler, laments his lot. He says he has been cast into hell to languish without succor and without hope. Well, Mathieu Marais was blind. Never more intensely than today had he, Father Panlou, felt the imminence of divine succor and Christian hope granted to all alike. He hoped against hope that despite all the horrors of these dark days, despite the groans of men and women in agony, our fellow citizens would offer up to heaven that one prayer which is truly Christian, a prayer of love, and God would see to the rest. It is hard to say if this sermon had any effect on our townsfolk. Monsieur Auton, the magistrate, assured Dr. Rieux that he had found the preacher's arguments absolutely irrefutable. But not everyone took so unqualified a view. To some, the sermon simply brought home the fact that they had been sentenced for an unknown crime to an indeterminate period of punishment. And while a good many people adapted themselves to confinement and carried on their humdrum lives as before, there were others who rebelled and whose one idea now was to break loose from the prison house. At first, the fact of being cut off from the outside world was accepted with a more or less good grace, much as people would have put up with any other temporary inconvenience that interfered with only a few of their habits. But now they had abruptly become aware that they were undergoing a sort of incarceration under that blue dome of sky, already beginning to sizzle with the fires of summer. They had a vague sensation that their whole lives were threatened by the present turn of events, and in the evening, when the cooler air revived their energy, this feeling of being locked in like criminals prompted them sometimes to foolhardy acts. It is noteworthy, this may or may not have been due to mere coincidence, that this Sunday of the sermon marked the beginning of something like a widespread panic in the town, and it took so deep a hold as to lead one to suspect that only now had the true nature of their situation dawned on our townspeople. Seen from this angle, the atmosphere of the town was somewhat changed, but actually it was a problem whether the change was in the atmosphere or in their hearts. A few days after the sermon, when Rieu, on his way to one of the outlying districts of the town, was discussing the change with Grand, he collided in the darkness with a man who was standing in the middle of the pavement, swaying from side to side without trying to advance. At the same moment, the street lamps, which were being lit later and later in the evening, went on suddenly, and a lamp just behind Rieu and his companion threw its light full on the man's face. His eyes were shut, and he was laughing soundlessly. Big drops of sweat were rolling down the face, convulsed with silent merriment. A lunatic at large, Grand observed. Rieu took his arm and was shepherding him on when he noticed that Grand was trembling violently. And if things go on as they're going, Rieu remarked, the whole town will be a madhouse. He felt exhausted, 
His throat was parched. Let's have a drink. They turned into a small cafe. The only light came from a lamp over the bar. The heavy air had a curious reddish tinge, and for no apparent reason, everyone was speaking in undertones. To the doctor's surprise, Gaunt asked for a small glass of straight liquor, which he drank off at a gulp. Fiery stuff, he observed. Then, a moment later, suggested making a move. Out in the street, it seemed to Rieu that the night was full of whispers. Somewhere, in the black depths above the street lamps, there was a low suffing that brought to his mind that unseen flail threshing incessantly the languid air of which Panlou had spoken. Happily, happily, Grand muttered, then paused. Rieu asked him what he'd been going to say. Happily, I've my work. Ah, yes, Rieu said. That's something, anyhow. Then, so as not to hear that eerie whistling in the air, he asked Gaunt if he was getting good results. Well, yes, I think I'm making headway. Have you much more to do? Gaunt began to show an animation unlike his usual self, and his voice took ardor from the liquor he had drunk. I don't know. But that's not the point, Doctor. Yes, I can assure you, that's not the point. It was too dark to see clearly, but Rieu had the impression that he was waving his arms. He seemed to be working himself up to say something, and when he spoke, the words came with a rush. What I really want, Doctor, is this. On the day when the manuscript reaches the publisher, I want him to stand up, after he's through reading it, of course, and say to his staff, Gentlemen, hats off. Rieu was dumbfounded, and to add to his amazement, he saw, or seemed to see, the man beside him making as if to take his hat off with a sweeping gesture, bringing his hand to his head, then holding his arm out straight in front of him. That queer whistling overhead seemed to gather force. So you see, Grand added, it's got to be flawless. Though he knew little of the literary world, Rieu had a suspicion that things didn't happen in it quite so picturesquely, that, for instance, publishers do not keep their hats on in their offices. But, of course, one never can tell, and Rieu preferred to hold his peace. Try as he might to shut his ears to it, he still was listening to that eerie sound above, the whispering of the plague. They had reached the part of the town where Grand lived, and, as it was on a slight eminence, they felt the cool night breeze fanning their cheeks and at the same time carrying away from them the noises of the town. Grand went on talking, but Rieux failed to follow all the worthy man was saying. All he gathered was that the work he was engaged on ran to a great many pages, and he was at almost excruciating pains to bring it to perfection. Evenings, whole weeks, spent on one word, just think, sometimes on a mere conjunction. Grant stopped abruptly and seized the doctor by a button of his coat. The words came stumbling out of his almost toothless mouth. I'd like you to understand, doctor. I grant you it's easy enough to choose between a, a but and an and. It's a bit more difficult to decide between and and then. But definitely the hardest thing may be to know whether one should put an and or leave it out. Yes, Rieu said, I see your point. He started walking again. Grand looked abashed, then stepped forward and drew level. Sorry, he said awkwardly. I don't know what's come over me this evening. Rieu patted his shoulder encouragingly, saying he'd been much interested in what Grand had said and would like to help him. This seemed to reassure Grand, and when they reached his place, he suggested, after some slight hesitation, that the doctor should come in for a moment. Rieu agreed. They entered the dining room, and Grand gave him a chair beside a table strewn with sheets of paper covered with writing in a microscopic hand, crisscrossed with corrections. Yes, that's it, he said, in answer to the doctor's questioning glance. But won't you drink something? I have some wine. Rieu declined. He was bending over the manuscript. No, don't look, Grand said. It's my opening phrase, and it's giving trouble, no end of trouble. He, too, was gazing at the sheets of paper on the table, and his hand seemed irresistibly drawn to one of them. Finally, he picked it up and held it to the shadeless electric bulb so that the light shone through. The paper shook in his hand, and Rieu noticed that his forehead was moist with sweat. Sit down, he said, and read it to me. Yes. There was a timid gratitude in Grand's eyes and smile. I think I'd like you to hear it. He waited for a while, still gazing at the writing, then sat down. Meanwhile, Rieu was listening to the curious buzzing sound that was rising from the streets as if in answer to the suffings of the plague. At that moment, he had a preternaturally vivid awareness of the town stretched out below, a victim world secluded and apart, and of the groans of agony stifled in its darkness. 
Then, pitched low but clear, Grand's voice came to his ears. One fine morning in the month of May, an elegant young horsewoman might have been seen riding a handsome sorrel mare along the flowery avenues of the Bois de Boulogne. Silence returned, and with it the vague murmur of the prostrate town. Grand had put down the sheet and was still staring at it. After a while he looked up. What do you think of it? Rieu replied that this opening phrase had whetted his curiosity. He'd like to hear what followed. Whereat Grand told him he'd got it all wrong. He seemed excited and slapped the papers on the table with the flat of his hand. That's only a rough draft. Once I've succeeded in rendering perfectly the picture in my mind's eye, once my words have the exact tempo of this ride, the horse is trotting one, two, three, one, two, three, see what I mean, the rest will come more easily. And what's even more important, the illusion will be such that from the very first words it will be possible to say, hats off. But before that, he admitted, there was lots of hard work to be done. He'd never dream of handing that sentence to the printer in its present form, for though it sometimes satisfied him, he was fully aware it didn't quite hit the mark as yet, and also that to some extent it had a facility of tone approximating, remotely perhaps, but recognizably, to the commonplace. That was more or less what he was saying when they heard the sound of people running in the street below the window. Rieux stood up. Just wait and see what I make of it, Grand said, and glancing toward the window added, when all this is over. But then the sound of hurried footsteps came again. Rieux was already halfway down the stairs, and when he stepped out into the street, two men brushed past him. They seemed to be on their way to one of the town gates. In fact, what with the heat and the plague, some of our fellow citizens were losing their heads. There had already been some scenes of violence, and nightly attempts were made to elude the sentries and escape to the outside world. End of Side 4 This book is continued on the next cassette. Please run this tape to the end.